no longer a question of if, it's a question of how we go after Saddam Hussein. In the weeks after 9-11, they seemed to be on every channel, gunning for Hussein. You're probably the hawkiest of the hawks on this. Why? Well, I don't know that I'd accept that characterization, but it's probably not too far uh, off. I, uh, I think that uh, the Baghdad uh, regime uh, is a serious danger to world peace. Weapons of mass destruction in the hands of Saddam Hussein, plus his known contact with terrorists, including al-Qaeda terrorists, is simply a threat too large to continue to tolerate. Among their leading spokesmen were Richard Pearl and James Woolsey. Both sat on the Defense Policy Board advising Donald Rumsfeld, and they used their inside status to assure the press that overthrowing Hussein would be easy. We would be seen as liberators in Iraq. Major newspapers and magazines gave them prime space to make their case, including the possibility that 9-11 had been sponsored, supported, and perhaps even ordered by Saddam Hussein. The president, they said, should take preemptive action. The biggest mistake we have made, it's, it's our mistake, it's not the mistake of the Arabs, was not finishing off Saddam Hussein in 1991. No one got more airtime from an armchair than Bill Kristol, editor of the Weekly Standard and a media-savvy Republican strategist. In the 1990s, Kristol had organized a campaign for increased military spending and a muscular foreign policy. In 1998, he and his allies wrote President Bill Clinton, urging him to remove Saddam Hussein from power. And now, just days after 9-11, with many of their allies serving in the administration, they wrote an open letter to President Bush, calling for regime change in Baghdad. Over the coming months, Crystal's weekly standard kept up the drumbeat. What are the consequences if the U.S. does not finish off uh, this uh, uh, Saddam Hussein as a second step in the war on terrorism? It would mean that the president, having declared a global war on terrorism, didn't follow through, didn't take out the most threatening uh, terrorist state in the, na in, in the world. The editorial page of the Wall Street Journal signed on. And so did high-profile pundits like the New York Times' William Sapphire. Sapphire, will you wager Ms. Wright right now that Saddam will be out of power by the end of 2002? Absolutely. I'll see you here a year from now. <laughs> if you go after Iraq, you're going to lose a lot of allies, but who cares? Remember. Charles Krauthammer and other top columnists at the Washington Post also saw the hand of Saddam Hussein in the terrorist attacks. Jim Hoagland implicated Hussein within hours after the suicide bomber struck on 9-11. And the Post George Will fired away on the talk shows. The administration knows he's vowed, Hussein has vowed revenge. He has anthrax. He loves biological weapons. He has terrorist training camps, including 707 to practice on. It was proving difficult to distinguish the opinion of the pundits from the policies of the administration. But as the hullabaloo over Saddam grew in Washington, Bob Simon of CBS News 60 Minutes was dumbfounded. He's based in the Middle East. From overseas, we had a clear view. I mean, we knew things or suspected things that perhaps the Washington press corps could not suspect. For example, the absurdity of putting up a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Absurdity? Hmm. The Washington press corps cannot question an absurdity? Well, maybe the Washington press corps based uh, inside the belt um, wasn't as aware as those of us who are based in the Middle East and who spend a lot of time in Iraq. I mean, when the Washington press corps travels, it travels with the president or with the secretary of state. and In a bubble. Yeah, in a bubble. Whereas we, who's, who'd spent weeks just walking the streets of Baghdad and in other situations in Baghdad, um, just were scratching our head in ways that perhaps at the Washington press corps could not. Simon was under no illusions about Saddam Hussein. During the first Gulf War, he and his camera crew were arrested by Iraqi forces and brutalized for 40 days before being released. Look, we're, we're going home, which is, the, which is the place you go to after a war when, if you've been as lucky as we've been. It didn't make sense to Simon that the dictator would trust Islamic terrorists. Saddam, as most tyrants, was a total control freak. He wanted total control of his regime, total control of the country. And to introduce a wild card like Al-Qaeda in any sense was just something he would not do. 
So I just didn't believe it for an instant. And some of the things that were said, many of the things that were said about Iraq didn't make sense. And that really prompts you to ask, wait a minute, is this true? Does everyone agree that this is true? Does anyone think this is not true? This, this is what we're going to do. This is plan A now. Yeah. John Walcott wasn't buying the official line either. The bureau chief of Knight Ritter News Service, he and his reporters covered Washington for 32 newspapers spread across the country. Our readers aren't here in Washington. They aren't up in New York. They aren't the people who send other people's kids to war. They're the people who get sent to war. And we felt an obligation to them to explain why that might happen. We were determined to scrutinize the administration's case for war as closely as we possibly could, and that's what we set out to do. So as he listened to pundits and officials talk